and welcome to How to Deal When the Shit Gets Real podcast. I'm Rietta. And I'm Connie. So, Stephanie, how do you deal when the shit gets real? Or just tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself. Yeah, well, you know, I um, I found myself just crying and laying on the bathroom floor and just like, God, why does all this stuff keep happening to me? Why me? I didn't do anything wrong. Why me? I'm a good person. I've done everything right. Yet mm -hmm. my life was just a shitty mess. And laying there, I just could not get past all this pain and suffering that had engulfed my life for so long. I spent over 17 years within these two abusive marriages and lost multiple homes. I had lost loved ones. I, I had a baby born with a, a very rare genetic disorder. And it's like all this shit just kept happening to me. And I was laying there at my sister's house on, on the tile floor, tears streaming down my cheeks and just like, why me? And, and I felt like in that moment, oh, and I had lost my eyesight. So here I am like blind at my sister's house. And I just felt like in that moment, God, the universe, divine source, you know, whomever we resonate with was saying, Stephanie, you are not seeing your story through the right lens. You need to let go of the victim story that are, you are holding on to. And you need to become the star of your story. And so I needed to shift my perspective. And when I shifted from why me to for me, then I could see the lessons. I could see what needed to be healed, what needed to be released, what needed to be let go. And I could become the star, the heroine of my story. Did you really become blind or are we metaphorically speaking? I did. Well, I, I did. So I was living in Florida at the time and I went boating with some friends and, you know, I have the really good UV sunglasses, but they broke. And so I just picked up a cheap pair on the way to the boat from the gas station. And I woke up the next morning and I couldn't see. Oh, my gosh. I yeah. barely made it to my eye doctor's office. And she said, Stephanie, your eyes are so damaged and so inflamed. Like, it's really rare, but I have like really, really light hazel eyes. And just being out on the boats and going on the islands and stuff, I destroyed my eyes. Um, I couldn't see for six weeks. And oh she said it looked, it looked like someone took sandpaper and just like oh, sanded. <laughs> you made me shudder just me. saying that. Oh, my I, gosh. It hurt to open them. I was like, I, I couldn't see. And, you know, when I made that shift in my perspective of, of letting go of the victim consciousness, the victim mindset that I held on to, then I, I honestly, I, I literally was able to start to slowly to start to see again. That's so funny. And so I, I felt like, you know, we have these things happen to us and they happen to us for, for a reason. And for me, it was, I literally was not seeing my life through the right lens. I, I had to physically go blind for divine to catch my attention and say, Stephanie, stop. Yeah. That is wild. And, to, and now everybody wants to play like the victim. Like I, you, you see it all the time on like, social media and then just in general everybody's like oh poor me and it's like N no 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 what the hell happened to like pick yourself up by your bootstraps like learning from mistakes and stuff why is all of a sudden everybody poor me or even well, just apologizing you know? when you victimize other people there was just that whole fiasco with oh, that yes. debut author that did all those horrible things and then wrote an apology that didn't actually apologize and turned her into the victim. And it's like, wait a minute, that's, that's not, mm -mm. Well, it's, you know, it's when you are in these abusive relationships 
uh, abusive marriage. For me, I was married to two narcissists. One, my first husband, I was with him for almost 14 years. He is a a covert narcissist. My second one, actually we celebrated our anniversary just a couple days ago because we're still not technically divorced yet. Um, but you, it is hard not to not see yourself as a victim, but you can only remain a victim for so long. Mm-hmm. And then okay. it's like, okay, then we need to, you need to see those lessons. And when we're stuck in this victim mindset, you can't mm-hmm. see those lessons. People would tell me, Stephanie, what have you learned? Well, I haven't learned anything because I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And how many of us say that? I didn't do anything wrong. Well, until you stop being the victim and, and let that go, you won't mm-hmm. see the lessons and you can't move on with your life. You will continue to repeat the same patterns over and over again, because that is what has happened to me. And if you think that we're here to learn the lessons and to grow, you're not growing when you're stuck in victim mindset. Absolutely. And I've seen a lot of people make the same choice in like a relationship, in whatever, over and over again. So I've, I've learned that lesson from watching other people kind of early because it was my mom (laughs) and I was young so so I learned I was like oh yeah yep don't make the same choices again and again I Mm -hmm. I see you (laughs) that's the only reason why (laughs) it's the only reason why because if it wasn't modeled for me of a person making the same choice in a toxic person twice in a row, the exact same person, almost the exact same person twice, except for one is worse and that person is not my father, then, you know, what can you do? I was like, oh my God, my mom picked the same guy again and he's worse. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do the same, Stephanie? Did you essentially kind of take the the same two people? I did. And you know, I, when I met my second husband, so I had been separated and going through the divorce with my first husband, it it took almost four years to, to get divorced. And so when I met my second husband, I thought I was healed. I thought I had done the work. I thought I was ready to date. And so I did what most of us do. I made the list, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, divorced dad with only boys because I'm a single mom with only boys. Um, someone who has lived overseas. Someone who has traveled, has a bigger world view. Um, so, you know, I, I made the list and I threw it out there to the universe. And I met the guy a week later who checked off everything on that list. And so, so you almost kind of felt like it was like meant to be because you made that list. Well, oh, and then a week totally. later, he was like, hello, I am here. Hello. Yes. And so when he would say things like, and this is what people with disordered personalities, they will say stuff like, you are my soulmate. I, I manifested you. I've been praying for you. God sent me you. Well, it resonated because I had been doing all of that as well. And I made the list and he checked off everything on the list. And so it's like, you think you are doing it all right. We, we uh, had a long distance relationship. I was like, let's just really get to know each other before we get serious and before it goes physical. Like, let's, let's really get to know each other. So we spent a couple months really getting to know each other. Now, I didn't know that he was mirroring me. So essentially, I fell in love with me. Myself, yeah. And and, and I go back to where, yes, I manifested him. I got exactly what I wanted. And the divine gave me all the unlearned lessons from my first marriage because that's what happens. You get what you ask for with all the unlearned lessons that you did not learn about. The first time, because again, we're here to learn the lessons, to grow, to be better versions of ourselves. So what are a couple of like the lessons from the first marriage that you should have learned for the second? 
or like yes. the second guy or just after? You know what I mean. Good, great question. So, um, you know, when I made that change of perspective where I needed to to let go of the victim mindset, I needed mm-hmm. to see both of my ex-husbands as teachers, not as monsters, because for so long I saw them as monsters trying to destroy my life. But when I was able to see them as teachers, I got out my little journal. And so I started with my first husband, Josh. And I said, okay, if Josh is this wise teacher, you know, again, it's, it is a bit of a, of a, a mental, whatever, you know, you, you, you just have to, you just, yeah, you just have to go there and do it because it works. And so I had to say, okay, this wise teacher, my first ex-husband, I am happy and grateful that you showed me that I need stronger boundaries in my life. Um, he had affairs for, for 10 years and he left with another married woman. And that was how the discard happened. But I thought I had boundaries, but really I had boundaries for him. And so I would, I would confront the other women stop talking to him, you know, he's married, blah, 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 you know, putting all these boundaries for him, I would cut, I became the boundaries police. And it's not our job and our responsibility to be boundaries for someone else. We can only be boundaries for ourselves. And if someone uh, does not honor and respect that boundary, then you have to to decide to, to go. And so going into my second marriage, I thought I had boundaries because, you know, it was a a lesson. I I was like, okay, I need to be better and more firm on these boundaries. And so with husband number two going in there, I had the boundaries, but really you might as well have just called it a a, a puppy gate or a, a toddler fence because he would push up against my boundaries and I would pick up my boundary and I would move move it over. Okay. Here's my boundary now. Then he would push up against the boundary. I would pick up my little my little toddler gate, move it over. And so it's not a boundary. A boundary is something that is firm and 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 secure and and is And you shall not does pass. not move. Yes, exactly. And so again, I didn't really have boundaries. So that was a big lesson. Another lesson was a worthiness. In my first marriage, he was constantly having affairs. And I could say, thank you, Josh, for showing me that I am worthy of so much more. So I could say, I am worthy of so much more. And I like to say worthy over deserving because so many people say deserving. Like, oh, you deserve so much better. Well, deserving means that you did something to deserve this. Worthiness is innate. I am worthy because it is who I am. I learned that was a, a lesson that I am worthy of so much more. When you have boundaries, when you know your worth, you're not going to put up with all of this with stuff. The bullshit. Exactly. <clears throat> and it's like, you know, another hard lesson is we cannot change people. We can only change ourselves. We can do the hard work. We can work on ourselves. And eventually over time, we might evolve out of that relationship. And there is nothing wrong with that i think in our society we there's just this uh this stigma that you stay together you work it out you do all this but what if one of us has evolved and grown out of the relationship and we are no longer able to tolerate or to be with someone who is not willing to evolve or do the hard work or work on themselves and it should be okay to say you know what I have outgrown you. I'm going to continue ascending and working on myself and growing. And there's someone else on your level who who might be there for you. Yeah. Unevolved. Unevolved and unwilling to do the work. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people will will relate to your your boundaries scenario. I think a lot of us struggle to put up boundaries and keep them. So. Oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we realize that not all, not all narcissists are the same, of course, but are there any signs or red flags that you can give to our listeners that they might be able to look for in a narcissistic yeah. relationship? Yeah. 
So when we um, first, I'll define what what a narcissist is. So uh, we all remember that Greek mythology where the man narcissism he narcissist he fell in love with his reflection. He never left the pool because he was just so infatuated, so himself. divinely obsessed with himself. So a narcissist is someone with a disordered personality. They have this huge, uh, grandiose sense of self-importance and self-worth. They feel like everyone is there to worship them and that everyone wants to worship them. This excessive need for, for admiration, um, the constant need for attention and just wanting all of your attention. I always hear people say, oh, they're like um, energy vampires because they just drain you of everything but they're so manipulative that they will manipulate they will gaslight they will do whatever it takes to get what they want um just a huge lack of empathy like no regard for your feelings or or for you because the relationship is all about them so red flags would be things that i have learned if if you are a woman on a date with a man or getting to know another man, one big red flag is how do they talk about women? What are they saying about women? Ask them how they feel if a woman was president. Um, how have, what is their relationship like with women in their lives? What is their relationship with their past girlfriends or past wives? Uh, what are they saying? Are they saying negative things or positive things? This was something that it, it threw me off because, you know, in the beginning, they put you on this, like I said, on this big pedestal. And so there is this idealization phase. It's where um, they love everything about you. Like I was saying in the beginning, they, they can't get enough of you. They, you are the most amazing, the most beautiful, the most caring, the most supportive. You are, you know, God's gift to them. It, my, my ex loved that I was an attorney. He loved that I was a strong, powerful, confident woman. He loved that I was a, a good mom. He loved that all my girlfriends were all these like big, strong, powerful women. He loved all of that. But yet when it came to the devaluation phase, he hated all my girlfriends. Oh, they're all just feminists, like blah, blah, blah. He hated my profession. And all he would do is just put me down, put my profession down, put what I did down. Um, he hated the way I parented. You know, and so it's like they, they go from mirroring you to criticizing you and, and bringing you down. And so... You know, when, when I would ask, when I asked him in the beginning about his ex-girlfriends, his, his, all of these women in his life, it wasn't always negative, but during the devaluation phase, it was every time. And then from then on, every time he talked about women, it was always talking about them in a negative way. Oh, women are always using the system. Women always trying to get men for everything. Oh, my ex-wife, she did all this, blah, blah, blah. And I have later gone back and looked at all of that and actually spoke with, with people. And it was all not true. Oh, yeah. You know? And so that is a red flag. Um, if you can catch it before you're, you're hooked is <laughs> how do they treat women? Are they disrespectful or are they kind and loving towards women? Um, drinking. I, at the time I was managing two vineyards. I live in Southern Oregon. We're wine country. And it was my, my fun job, um, when I was going through my divorce. And so I was around drinking all the time. And so it, it drinking didn't bother me. But I had la I later learned that he was hiding gallons of vodka. You know, mm -hmm. so again, it's like, oh, we talk about all these red flags. And narcissists are good at hiding the red flags. Oh, they are yeah. very good at hiding them. People are like, Absolutely. didn't you see the red flags? No, I didn't see it. I didn't see all the, all the vodka because he was hiding it and I wasn't looking for it. Yeah. I trusted him. 
he was talking wonderfully about women when I first, you know, was with him. And so, you know, it's like, it's very hard. Yeah. Like you said, they, they basically hook you. And then once you're hooked, it's like, ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah, no, it is so true. And so, you know, my background is domestic violence. And domestic violence is back then, you know, 20 plus years ago, it wasn't focused on the emotional and the psychological abuse. It was focused on physical violence. And so now you find it, us in these relationships. Well, there's not the physical violence. My first husband was a cheater. How many of us do that? How many of us put cheating over here and abuse over here? Oh, he's just a cheater. Oh, he just cheats. He cheats. That's yeah. abuse. That's emotional and psychological abuse. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it took me a long time to, to, to understand that even though I was do, working domestic violence cases, I didn't see myself as a victim of domestic violence. I didn't see myself as a victim of narcissistic abuse. I don't know about you, but like my mom like internalized the cheating too. It was always her fault. It was never my dad being mm -hmm. really a narcissist, honestly. But it was never my dad. It was always, it was my fault. I got fat. I'm ugly. Like, I'm awful. I'm a horrible person. I'm a horrible mom. That's why he cheated. And it's like, no, no, no. You, you need to stop internalizing that because it's his problem. It's what mm -hmm. he did. He did it to you. You're not the problem. He's the problem. But if you have someone who is behind closed doors where you're not in that conversation and he's like, you're so fat and ugly, you made me do oh, this. Yeah. I mm -hmm. wouldn't have gone searching if you would just take care of your body. Oh, I yeah. wouldn't have gone looking for other women if you had just been emotionally available to me, meaning fawn all over me and, yep. and, that was my and not talk to anyone else. And so, you know, it's, it's very hard after someone has, is constantly saying all that negative oh, yeah. stuff to you. It's hard not to internalize it and say, well, it must be me. And actually towards the end though, my dad didn't like me because I was too young. I don't remember this like all that clearly. I just remember like my mom's like, oh yeah. You would like get your dad so riled up because I would say, well, aren't you going to tell her that you love her? Aren't you going to go and get her flowers? Like I was like, dad, uh -huh. now don't you need to treat your woman right? And it would frustrate the frick out of him because it's like a little 10 year old being like, why aren't you saying I love you to mommy? Yeah. Right. It was so funny when she told me that I was like, really? <laughs> she was like, oh yeah, he was really pissed off about that. Well, and, and, you know, it's it, what happens with people who are, who find themselves in these relationships and I find themselves, I mean, yes, I guess we, we call it in, you know, with our un, unlearned lessons and stuff, repeating the same patterns. But, um, you know, there's a thing called a trauma bond. And for anyone who doesn't know what a trauma bond is, a trauma bond is when there is a cycle of intermittent reinforcement. So there's the really good high times followed by really low, hard, negative times, idealization phase, and then devaluation, idealization, devaluation. And so you're stuck in this inter intermittent reinforcement and through all of that and with, you know, the gaslighting, and everything, it really creates this um, cognitive dissonance. And then with that forms this trauma bond. And so we know that it's going to be bad, but we know that it's good also. And so you get stuck in this pattern that keeps you stuck. And I always describe it like a, like a drug addiction. Okay. And I used to even say this to my husband, I feel so addicted to you. And it's like, why? Yeah. It's because of the trauma bond. And so you have, so think of like a, a drug addict. The first time uh, they use a drug, they get this huge high, this huge dopamine rush, right? 
And so the next time they use again, they're trying to get that first high, but you never get that first high. And so you use again, you use again, and you use again. But every time you use, it just gets lower and lower. You never reach but you are constantly chasing that dopamine high and that's what keeps you addicted in that um, cycle and it's similar with a trauma bond because we know that they know how to love us we know that they know how to be kind to us we know that they know how to treat us well why don't they so we wait when it gets bad we're like we, we wait and then the love bomb comes and they start love bombing us back to them. And then it's like, oh, here he is again. Here's the person I fell in love with. And then they devalue again. And it's like, ah, I need to get out of this. This is miserable. I don't want to be here. I, I, I hate this person. And then they love bomb you back. Oh, no, I love him. Yes, I love him. Oh, he's great. He's wonderful. It was an emotional affair, not a physical affair. We justify Oh, yeah. Was that Intel. moment on the bathroom floor when you finally reached your breaking point? Or was that after marriage, too? That was after marriage, too. That was, I was done. They were monsters. They were both out to destroy me. And um, So how did you finally come to realize that marriage one needed to be done so? So marriage one was with with Josh, we were together for a very long time. And um, he, he, he left. He again, you know, I was a boundaries person, I kept confronting this woman, hey, he's married, leave him alone, blah, blah, blah. And um, he eventually one day just walked out and was like, I'm gonna go see if the grass is greener. I think I'm gonna go be with her. And she was married and had two kids too. I we had two kids. It, we all went to the same church together. We were all in the same church, oh my God. Bible study group, all of this stuff. It was uh the real question wow. is, is he still with her? No, well, he died. Yeah, yeah. Because she said that earlier. Sorry. Yeah. So, so what um, happened there? I'm just curious. So he he committed suicide. Um, oh, my God. He started. So after he left, it was six years of post-traumatic separation abuse. So then he used <laughs> the courts against me. And, I mean, I, we have spent... So much money fighting over non nonsense. He would just file um, frivolous motions after frivolous motions after frivolous motions. It's like how much was his? If was he paying his attorney? Because I know how much I was paying mine, and I am an attorney. Um, oh my god! Yeah, really. You know, and so <laughs> it was a it was a nightmare. It was truly a nightmare. And it, towards the end, when I left husband number two, he was actually trying to alienate my children from me. And I just kept thinking, no, it's, I knew that God told me I would be vindicated. I knew that all of this was wrong. And, you know, uh, it, it's a disordered personality, you know, and, and they, they, live in so much um hurt and you know i mean i'm not i'm not a psychologist i'm not going to get into all the the self stuff for for a narcissist and what makes them who they are but he had mm -hmm. done so much hurt and damage to me and to my children i don't think he could live with himself anymore and and he couldn't and so he he did commit suicide two months ago um I mean, still terrible. You'd never wish that upon anybody. No, it's it's horrible. I, I never wanted that for him. I wanted him to work with me so we could work through all of this stuff. But when you have someone who is so adamant about destroying you, he was actually destroying his own life. Clearly. Um, yeah. And so I am just very grateful that I've always had a very open and honest relationship with my children. They knew what he was doing. We would talk about it. Hey, he's trying to do this. He's trying to do this. He attempted first, and then he, he did it again three weeks later. And so, you know, it's like I had to talk to my boys about this. And, you know, a couple of hours after he had taken his own life, my, you know, my nine-year-old says to me, he said, Mom, we can go travel the world now. 
Oh my gosh. You know, and 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 that's his way of saying that we are free. Yeah. We are free because it's terrible he had to know that though. It is it's horrible. Especially I wouldn't wish this nine. on anyone. But at the same time, it's like I also didn't want them influenced by him. Oh no, absolutely he wasn't, not. He wasn't a good person. It, and they would have been influenced by them had you not told them because mm-hmm. they'd be like, oh, no, like because you're, you're not being like open and honest about it. So he can use that against you. Oh, yeah. And just doing in general. It for their own protection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just in general, kids are gullible like by nature like they're gonna believe what their dad tells them or what their mom tells like both parents they're gonna believe dad and mom like they're gonna be like what are you talking about what what's going on like they're gonna be confused probably more than anything if you're not honest with them well narcissists yeah. never stop um i dated exactly. one in high school and um i'm still friends with his sister i adore her um and he still tries to find ways 15 years later to manipulate himself into a situation and i don't i don't talk to him i have any i don't have any ties to him but he'll still try to find like little ways to just be ridiculous and i'm like like trying to get your attention or an emotional response from you yeah he like remembered my phone number first of all which is weird um and he's married now and tried to text me and be like, I need yeah. marriage advice. You're barking up the wrong tree, buddy. Well, mm-hmm. and you know, they they always come back because unless you completely go no contact and cut everything off, they you are leaving room. They they you are supply on the side. Yep. You know, my I and you have no closure. It, it's very bizarre. It is. And so, you know, with my first husband, we had no relationship. After he walked out the door, it, it it was, I did not exist. And he was trying to do everything to make me not exist as if I was not there. Um, but then, you know, six years later, he called me. He gave me the cry. He was crying. He apologized for everything. It was so weird. And he was married to someone else. Exactly. And, exactly. You know, it, it was like. It, it it was very confusing. Like so many, uh, it was the stuff I wanted to hear six years ago. Yeah, exactly. But not anything uh, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and and it's, it's like, it, and then it was very confusing. He's, I I still love you. All this stuff, and then when, and, and then with him trying to do other things, it was like, no, what is, no, no, no. What are you doing? What no. a mess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try to do like. He sent me the text, like, and I literally showed it to my husband. I'm like, you can respond to this if you want, but I'm not. And then, of course, I told his sister. I'm like, listen, I'm not trying to put you in an awkward spot, but I'm not going to respond to it. So maybe the next time you see me, you would just be so kind to say, leave my friend alone. She's my friend now. Yeah, You have lost yeah. any sort of association with her many, many years ago because um, yeah. I'm not going to talk to you. Um, he actually was in trouble when he was young and wanted to like petition the court to get something dropped off his record. And he asked me to write a letter (laughs) and I was like, are you, no, are you, have you lost your damn mind? I don't think so. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. No, not to like, so I, uh, so my second husband, you know, we're not fully divorced yet because I haven't been able to find him. And, oh, that's fun. Uh, <laughs> well, I did, fi- I did find him. I'll tell you how. So back in September, I had a missed call from a bail bondsman in Florida. And I was like, oh, golly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's calling me? But see, I would get, I have a Florida phone number and, and I would get like all these phone all these random phone phone calls from people. So whoever had my phone before me, I think he was in trouble with the law a lot because I got calls from sheriffs and other things. I'm like, no, this isn't his phone number. Please stop uh, calling sorry, me. Please stop. I know, I know. And so when I got the number, when <laughs> it was the bail bonds, I didn't think anything of it. I was just like, oh, it's, you know, whoever had this phone before me, it's, it's his mess again. Well, about a month later, it was around October, 
my my sister sends me my my ex husband's mugshot. He got a the third DUI. Oh no! And I went back and I looked at the dates and I pulled up my phone records. And it was like oh, him calling me. Like I would bail him out. I haven't even talked to him in so long. Like I would bail you out. That's what's wild to me about narcissists. They literally don't. There's like no boundary. Like, hey, I haven't talked to you in six years, and I just walked out on you. But will you come bail me out of jail? No, absolutely yeah, not. I don't. It was just like so bizarre. I'm like, why would I bail you out? Stay in there. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Felicia. Bye. Like, <laughs> oh, and I, and yeah, like, absolutely. What? No, I've gotten completely no contact. I can't even. Oh. <laughs> yeah, don't don't so, remember my name. So, what happened with now? Since you gave us the story of the first husband, now let's talk through the second husband. Okay, so husband number two, I uh, his name was Jace, and and here are some some Jace and Josh. I was going to say you need, I was going to say you need to stay away they with both. Jay. I was more thinking Jay. Yeah. Yep, Jay's Aquarius. I guess I have a thing for Jay's and Aquarius. I have two kids with the, the with Jay's as their first name as well. So, um, I'm an Aquarius um, though, so there are good ones. No, just so FYI. no, no. I love Aquarius women. Some of my very best friends are Aquarius women. It is Aquarius men that I'm like weirdly attracted to, and then they turn out to be narcissists. So, <laughs> no to self. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Aquarius women. Now I love you guys. You're like my best friend. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it, everything was great in the beginning. I thought I manifested him. He is my soulmate. He called me his soulmate. It was wonderful until we, he got me hooked. We, we met and got married within the same year and, uh, which was really fast, but it was our sec it was both of our second marriages and we both had really big, huge first weddings. And so I was like, you know, that's just whatever. Let's just get it uh, done. Let us just do it. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what we did. And so um, it was great. And I didn't notice anything until he had me hooked and, and married. And Blind and then, <laughs> then, yeah. And, but then 2020 hit. So we got married in, in December of uh, 2019. And then 2020 hit. And it was like the whole world went crazy. And mm -hmm. he went into the devaluation. And so it was very confusing because I didn't know I had only known him for a year and I didn't mm -hmm. know what was actually truly him. What was just exacerbated because we were all in 2020 and the world was crazy. So I, I, I didn't know. And I, I struggled with that for a really long time. And he would have, there was a lot of gaslighting. And so gaslighting is when someone tries to alter your perception of reality. So um, he would say, oh, that didn't happen like that. Oh, Stephanie, you are so sensitive. You are oversensitive. Oh, you must be on your period. You're going to start your period. You know, it's like, it's all you. It's never them. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, I just couldn't figure out what, what was going on because his behavior would it dramatically change from, you know, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. I didn't know which one which would be one? presented that day. And so I've always been a writer and I've always kept journals. And so I would, I would write these things and he would try to tell me that didn't happen. That didn't happen like that. I, you know, all the wineries shut down. Um, I had a huge, a, a huge cellar and stuff and I stopped drinking because I wanted to be uh, emotionally not um, reactive and I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And so I stopped drinking and I stopped, I tried to be like very aware and he just got meaner and meaner and more evil. And I actually separated from him. I got a restraining order against him. And, and spent a couple months apart from him. That's why I found EFT and a whole bunch of other things. But then, you know, it's, I was still so confused. And, and that's why they like to keep you in this like constant state of confusion. And then his mother kept calling me, oh, he misses you. He's changed. He's, 
nobody changes after two months. Give them a couple of years, maybe. Yes. We'll see oh if they God. change. Um, yeah. But his mom's like, Stephanie, he loves you so much. He's so sorry. He he made a mistake. He's so sorry. He loves you. And will you please talk to him? Please work it out. We love you. All this stuff. And so, you know, they call these the, the flying monkeys. They're their little... You know the wicked witches, little monkeys mm-hmm. go out, and so they they call them the flying monkeys. And so I agreed to meet him. And again, yeah, it was it was twenty twenty still, and and all of Oregon was on fire. If you remember, like I don't know if you remember, but the West, whole West Coast was on fire yes. in twenty twenty. Yes. And I so there was a part of me too that was like super scared, like and so many people had all these conspiracy theories and. Oh, and, you know, yes. narciss- narcissists love a good conspiracy theory. And so I was like, I could feel that fear. Like, oh my God, it's like the whatever's happening, all, all of Oregon's on fire. I mean, I was on high the evacuation. My friends were packing up their stuff. A lot of my friends had already been evacuated. And so I was like, okay, fine. I, I will go and, and talk to him. And of course, he love bombed me back. Because that is what you, they do. And you can see it, you know, they say it takes um, a person leaving like seven to nine times before they actually leave. Leave. Mm-hmm. It's the trauma bond. It is the love mm-hmm. bombing. It is all this stuff that keeps us stuff. And for me, it was all of that on top of just the world was, was collapsing. <laughs> yeah. And so it was like, you know, I just, I just didn't know what was reality. What was, what was him? What was 2020? What was this? It was just the, a nightmare. Mm-hmm. And so we got back together and I told him, well, you need to go and um, do like an abuser recovery program, go to AA and stuff. And he did all of that, but he didn't, he did it to just appease me i honestly think he just went into a room and just let the stuff play because he didn't take anything seriously he was great again like the like the idealization phase he was great for about four months but then his behavior changed again he started drinking again he started doing all this stuff and for me it was like i mean how much are you willing to put up with how much because you keep drawing these lines you keep saying enough is enough but yet you're not leaving and mm-hmm. so I just kept like, okay, well, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. And um, then December came of, of 2021, and he went into the hospital, and he almost died and was in the hospital for a month. And then when he came out of the hospital, his ex-wife died of COVID. And so it was like, and then we got three extra kids. And so I was like, oh, my God, he's sick. Now I have three extra children who just lost their mom. I can't leave now. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's hard. Hmm. That is. And so, you know, and, and I've been with these boys for many years and now their mom is dead and I'm the only other mother figure and stuff. And so it was, it was a nightmare. Um, and so I couldn't leave. I didn't feel like I could leave. And then there would be, you know, these little periods of hope. Okay. He just almost died in the hospital for drinking too much. He's destroyed his pancreas. Maybe he'll stop drinking. You know, when he's not drinking, he's a better person. Mm-hmm. Um, no, because it's not yeah, about the alcohol. It's about his power and control. They drink. That's just the, just the something they do. Yeah. But um, it's about power and control. And so they will, they will manipulate and gaslight, like I was saying, to control you. And when they can't get a reaction from you or a response from you, they will go to physical violence. And if that doesn't work, they will just discard you and move on. Or you finally get up enough courage and enough self-worth and you say, I've had enough and you leave them. And you leave them, yeah. And so we moved to Florida and I actually didn't move because he moved to Florida with his kids and me and my children, we share a baby and our baby stayed here in Oregon. And um, because I was still dealing with my my first ex-husband uh, but then when I finally did go back to Florida, it was great for a couple months. But during the time that we were apart for about eight months, I really continued to work on myself and continue to do more deep healing so that when I did meet up with him, 
it was just a lot of bullshit I was no longer willing to put up with. Good for you. And very, very quickly, the mask came off. He went on this narcissistic rage for, for three three weeks. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen. Um, and if you can imagine, like, a almost six-foot-four toddler punching walls, slamming doors, doing all this <clears> stuff, <throat> because he also knew. He knew that he could no longer control me. I stopped reacting. I was done. It's amazing that and what happens when you just stop reacting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is amazing. Because that'll piss them off more than anything else. Yeah, because they, they no longer can control you. And he no longer could control me. And I was, you know, I, I felt like this this slave. I mean, I was only, we, we were separated for, you know, eight months. And then I was, we were together for three months. But during that time, it's like, we had six children, six boys under 14. I was doing everything, like paying the bills, cleaning the house, doing, we had three kids in private school. Uh, you know, so I had to take them, I had to drive because there's no buses and two at this other school. They all played on multiple soccer teams. They all did all this stuff. And it was like, I was doing everything. And every time I'd bring it up to him, you need to help me. He would just start crying and 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 deflect everything. <laughs> Not helpful. It was so so bizarre. It was so bizarre. And so now so, is it uh, you and your three kids back in Oregon, or did you stay in yep. Florida? No, no, we we left. We got out of there as fast as we could. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, his his. Um, giant uh, narcissistic rage it was three weeks of tormenting me keeping me up all night shining lights in my face doing all this stuff and finally i had enough i reached over and i punched him so leave me the fuck alone i'm done i'm leaving and mm-hmm. then it got very physical and um very violent and he tried to he wouldn't let me leave. I tried to get out of the rooms. We had, we had two doors, and I would go to this door, and he would block it. I would go to this door, he would block it. I ate, and then uh, he destroyed my phone. He broke a whole bunch of his stuff, and then he took the baby and wouldn't give me my baby, and then he called 911. I actually went to jail that night. Um, oh, my God. They have everything planned. So many people say, oh, they're so crazy. They're so psycho. No, they are not. They have a disordered personality. They are not crazy and they are not psycho. They know exactly what they are doing. Mm -hmm. This was his discard. Mm -hmm. A very uh, Uh, aggressive discard. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so... um, you know, even the, the officer, I'm like, why are you arresting me? And it was a woman. And she said, he has a better story. And he has blood on his face because you punched him. I'm sorry. I've never punched anyone in my life. And my one little tiny punch did not get him blood on his face. He went and punched himself and hurt himself and did other things. And she's like, well, he has cuts all over his hands. Yeah, he's been punching walls for three weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, I mean, er- everything has been dropped and, and all this stuff. I was not prosecuted. Thank God. Um, but, you know, it's like. You still had to go through it all. Care. I still had to go through it all. And and it's like, and, and, you know, like, I mean, CPS got involved. And I went and talked to CPS. And, of course, you know, they believe me. They're like. As I've learned more about his story and his past, I had, you know, I've, I've, I've done my research now. <laughs> this would be another <laughs> red flag or maybe just a, a piece of advice. Do a background check on anyone you give your phone number to. I do not give my phone number to anyone until I've done like a full thorough background check. And I am so grateful that my sister is like a private eye. And so she runs background checks and does everything now. I would have known. I could have seen his record. And I here actually, I am. You're I like actually, you're you're. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say I actually just saw like the funniest reel. It was like a woman's like, yeah, scoping out the pre uh, pre TSA check because you know the government's already done your background check for you, <laughs> so I don't have to do as much 
research. I was yeah. like, that's, that's real funny. No, well, it's like, it, it's true. And here I am, I'm a very educated woman. I come from a good family. My family is not, uh, I had healthy relationships modeled to me. Hmm. I know the legal system. This is my office. They can happen to me. You can happen to anybody. It can happen to anyone. Yeah, absolutely. There's I'm probably you know, a bunch of listeners are... who are just realizing, oh shit, that person's a narcissist. Because <laughs> I've thought of two just as, as we're talking here. This is why we talk about it. <laughs> yes, and, and this is why I share my story too, because you know, I didn't realize I was in these abusive relationships and my background is domestic violence. Yeah. And so they they creep up on you. It's they get you hooked, they get you addicted, you get trauma bonded, you get stuck in a cycle. It's very, very challenging and hard to leave. But you are worth it. You are so worthy of so much more. And so, you know, for any listeners, like, yeah, it's hard to leave. There's so much freedom on the other side. They will tell you, you will never find anyone else like me. You will never have another lover who can sexually please you the way I can. You will never have anyone who will take care of you. You will never all these things. You know what? There's so much better on the other side like don't believe those lies yeah that's what they are that's all they are, are lies mm-hmm. so speaking of you being an attorney how has being an attorney help you help others that are dealing with narcissists like in the court system um so i'm actually not practicing right now just for you know baby and of course life and ex-husband but What I I do, um, I help people, you know, I do some consulting on the side. So helping people navigate the legal and going on podcasts and sharing like how, how do you prepare for a battle against a narcissist in court? Um, How do you parallel parent? So that this is more of the the legal stuff I do now. Um, So, you know, if you are trying to leave a narcissist you want to you really want to make sure you have an attorney that understands one domestic violence but two a disordered personality like narcissists because not all all people do and i mean how many lawyers are narcissists themselves so <laughs> you know you know it's, it's just like with a therapist as well you want a therapist who understands the nuances of domestic violence and of a relationship with a narcissist um keep keep track of everything they will use everything they can against you one i made a, a comment to my first husband that um he was, I called him a liar. I said, I can't believe you just went on the stand and lied to the judge and you did all this stuff. But you know what? The next time we went in court, he went up there and said, he is terrified of me because I was um, verbally aggressive towards him. Document everything. Have oh, a yeah. video camera. Have an, a parenting app, um, you know, so that all communication is just done through the app where you can't delete text. Um, keep track of everything. I would even, I would <clears throat> screenshot and put onto PDF files, like the length of our phone calls. Even when I was talking with the boys, I would, um, everything I documented, I have a banker's box full of everything. And even now, you know, even though my first husband has died, I'm still terrified to get rid of that. I don't know. <laughs> You know, yeah. like they're gonna come back all of a sudden. Yeah, right. Like his ghost or something. It's like, oh my god, I threw away everything I had, and now there's like some random weird issue. Like I'm throwing away that box. I'm gonna go keep it. I'm gonna go find it at my parents' house because you know. Mm-hmm. But but save everything. I had to document everything. I had to save everything, um, and. You know, you, you have to go to court so many times. I had to sit there in court and have, like, complete lies 
so many of us as as the victims and the survivors I mean, they will go up there and lie out of their their teeth. Like, they don't care who they hurt or manipulate. They don't even care about the judge because they're above their judge. I've had that happen. I mean, I've seen it happen so many times. You know, and so we can't be, you can't emotionally respond. You can't react when you're in court. Uh, Mm -hmm. You have to be very professional. You just have to sit there and take it. Um, it just happened to my mom. She uh, got taken to court <laughs> randomly by this. Did my mom tell yes. you? Yes. Yeah. By and this I kept on calling goofy. her the um. What did I? What did I call her? I was like, Oh yeah, you're the rebel. <laughs> yeah, she got taken to court by this random neighbor because she was walking. You know, she's not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. Um, but when they went to court. For her to combat this temporary restraining order that that he got for no reason, he lost it in the courtroom. He couldn't even control himself, even though the so he cooked his own goose because he just absolutely went bananas and just proved to the to the judge that he was the one that was the problem. Yeah. Well, what what happens in court with your ex, who is the narcissist? It's actually. What I have experienced and what I have seen is actually the opposite because it's very hard to sit there when people are making false accusations against you, when people are lying, when people are doing this. And if you react, the judge will take it out on you because, again, they want to control your reactions, your responses, and your emotions. Yeah. She did. In the courtroom. And so they listening to all his shenanigans, but, um, my dad's a police officer, so he's just like, Don't do anything. Don't react. It'll be okay. Don't react. Don't react. <laughs> and so, and so, but that's what I've seen. And this is why a lot of times the narcissist will win because mm-hmm. they do not show any emotion. And then the victim has an emotional outburst. And then they say, see, told you she was crazy. Yeah, unfortunately. And so you have to do the opposite. You cannot react. And I can't even stress that enough. So if you find yourself in in court, you can, it is, it takes so much self-control. You might as well just bring one of those little stress balls in your pocket so you can squeeze it. Mm -hmm. Or go home and scream Um, into your pillow when the, when it's all said. Oh yeah. You can't, you can't react. Your friends can't react. Your, I mean, I've seen people get kicked out of courtrooms. I've seen all of this just for a tiny reaction because again, yeah, it's all about power and control. And if they Mm -hmm. can control your emotions, if they can control your reactions and your, your reactions and they win because it's a game. Mm -hmm. That's a sick game. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you are parenting with them, it is the most horrible feeling in the world to have to send your children with them. So this is why I've always been very open and honest with my kids. Like, hey, you know, your dad's not in the right place mentally. Your dad is <laughs> yeah, is sick. Um, this is how we treat people. You know, we treat people with kindness. We treat people with this and with that. Yeah. And then again, uh, document everything. I would always, after they would come back from, from their dad's house, I would document. I would write up a little piece of paper. Okay, they've come back. This is how they're reacting. This is what they told me. This is what happened. And it's like, you just have to do this. It's terrible you have to do that, but got to do what you mm-hmm. got to do. Mm-hmm. And then hire a custody evaluator. You know, they they go by different names and different. Um, I think like in in some places they call them like a guardian guardian ad liem, um, or a child custody evaluator. Get a child custody evaluation as soon as possible, because you really don't want to split custody. You want full custody. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No no doubt about and, it. Yeah. All right. Well, do you have anything else to share with our listeners? Uh, yeah. So I would just say, you know, if you, if any of this resonates with you and you are in a situation that you don't want to be in, one, it does get better. Um, 
And and do you have the key, the the keys to to heal yourself within? You might need some tools. I had to do. Uh, I did EFT. I became an EFT practitioner, and you know it's a it's a healing modality. There are so many healing modalities out there. Find one that resonates with you. Do the hard inner work. Learn the lessons. Break the patterns. Break the trauma bond, and and go on and have a a happy life because you're worthy of so much more. I love it. That's a great final word. So we're going to end it right here. This is how to deal when the shit gets real and we will see y'all next episode.